For the program today, we thought it would be interesting to visit the Beef Research Farm south of Ankeny, where the crossbreeding project is underway. The uh, project is under the direction of Dick uh, Wilhelm of the Animal Science Department at Iowa State. Dick, I think, first of all, we might say just a word. Uh, what is the purpose of this project? Well, the purpose of this project uh, is to look at the introduction of dairy blood into an intensive beef production program. And today, I think we can show you some of the first uh, fruits of this, uh, of this endeavor. I notice you have several different crosses listed on this chart here. Right. What I thought we could do today was go through this beef dairy crossbreeding, uh, the first phase of it, to see exactly what kind of crosses we were producing. Across the top, you see here the four different, well, there's two beef breeds, Angus and Hereford, and Holstein and Brown Swiss, and these are the bulls. And down here are the cows, mm -hmm. the Angus, Hereford, Holstein, and Brown Swiss cows. And we have these calves that we're going to look at marked in this fashion, so that this is a straight Angus, straight Hereford, straight Holstein, and straight Brown Swiss. I've drawn a, a cross here in the, in the table so that you can see the beef and the beef cross and the two straight breads and the uh, dairy cows bred to beef bulls and the beef bulls bred to the dairy cows, those two segments, and then over here, the dairy bred to the dairy. Mm -hmm. Now, before we look at the calves, uh, what about this performance chart we have over here? Okay. What we have listed here are the birth weights of the calves up to uh, last week. As you can see, we've got a roughly a 60-pound birth weight yeah. on the Angus, roughly 70 pounds on the Hereford, which is, which is average, 84 and 83 on the Holstein and the Swiss. The interesting thing about this is if you average the beef, these four, and you average the dairy, down here, these four, and then you average these eight right here, you can look at a comparison of this plus this versus this and this which would give you some indication if you're getting any hybrid vigor yeah. in birth weight. <coughs> and to this point, we have no indication that the calves are any more than just the average of these two. Is in other right? words, there's no hybrid vigor, which is good for us because we've got to get the calves out of the cows. Yeah. Well, now we have some rather uh, odd colored calves, shall we say here. Uh, if we can turn around and look at some of these, I see you have them numbered, which gives their cross. Uh, why don't you pick out uh, several of these, Dick, and tell well, us. Well, of course, them. these with the white faces, uh, have Hereford in them. Those that are black have uh, have Angus. Um, there's some exceptions to this. There's there's a couple of calves that are of some interest. Uh, this one four calf right over here, uh, he'll come to the camera in a minute, is an Angus on a brown Swiss showing the red Angus, yeah. uh, the red coming out, <laughs> the red gene coming out. The, the calves that really, really surprise us as far as size and so on are those that are numbered 3-4 and 4-3. Those are the Brown Swiss Holstein or Holstein Brown Swiss crosses and as you can see they're pretty good sized calves. The uh, straight uh, straight Hereford and then uh, we have we have some Angus calves that are pretty outstanding that are that are mated uh, that are bred uh, to uh, uh, Holstein and, and Brown Swiss uh, cows. Well, now, which These numbers calves. are they, Dick? Well, this one three right over here is quite a quite a good calf. I think he's got plenty of muscling and and, and a good sized calf. Of course, you can't complain about the straight Swiss. This four four, that uh, that fawn colored calf right there, is being a, a, a good looking calf. The four four then is a straight Swiss. Straight Swiss calf. Now we're doing this uh, so that we can measure the amount of heterosis that we get out of this kind of study. We, you have to have the parent breeds. Uh, and we're producing these parent breeds here on the farm so that we can compare their performance with the crosses performance. Now, what about some of these other numbers? Uh, 30, what is that, 23 there, the white face? 23 would be a, a Hereford Holstein cross. And 3-1 uh, is uh, a Holstein bull on an Angus cow versus this 1-3 or the reciprocal cross. You see where the, where the 1 is the Angus bull and the 3 is the Holstein cow. I think you can see a, a, a little bit of milk difference there. Yeah. <laughs> and then the uh, what about this little one over here? Let's see, what's his number? That's a 2-1. That's a Hereford two Angus one. cross. Now those are, uh, you see from the, from the weight chart over here, there are no slouches as far as weight. They don't look too big 
uh, in this in this group where you have the uh, the real big uh, calves. In other words, they're a little lower set, aren't yeah, they? Yeah, they're a little lower set. Mm -hmm. Now, are there any other calves in here of particular interest that we should look for? Well, uh, a lot of people have seen the Hereford Swiss cross, the ones with the the light red with the with the white face. Now, let's see what's that number there. Can you tell? That will be a two four or a four two. Now, there's one right over yeah. there. So you're getting uh, various colors in this crossing, aren't you? Yes, yeah, we, we sure are. And, uh, uh, but we're also getting, getting some real frame on these calves uh, as, they're, as they're dropped and, and they take right off and, and go with the milk that they have available. And I'm sure in the feedlot they'll, they'll do an awful good job. Well, now these calves will be carried on to market weight, will they, Dick? Yes, these calves will be, actually they'll be brought in here the first of January in in these traps, and their mothers will be will be fed and rebred, and then in May we'll wean these calves at 180 days of age. They'll be weaned, and when we do that, we'll just take the cows out. I see. And we'll leave the calves right in here and finish them out, where the first of November they'll go to slaughter at a year of age. Well, now, Dick, will some of these calves then be kept for breeding purposes and continuous crossbreeding then? Is that right? Uh, Dale, what we plan to do is save the heifer calves out of these single crosses to produce single cross females oh, I to see. go on and make a three-way cross uh, commercial calf. See? But, and we're also going to save some of the bulls as some of the crossbred bulls so we can mate back to straight-bred cows and produce three-way cross calves by way of the bull and then have those out of the hef out of these heifers that are, are crossbred by way of the cow you see and we can look at maternal heterosis uh, uh, of these uh, of the the cows is how they milk and so on i hope you have a good bookkeeper to keep all these records straight. Uh, we're, we're, we've got good bookkeepers <laughs> <laughs> now dick i think it'd be fun to take a look at the uh, mothers of these calves these are the uh, cows of the four different breeds the Hereford, Angus, Swiss, and Holstein that, that we purchased that produced the crossbred calves here that you see. So there we have the uh, cows, the original cows of this herd, and uh, Dick, I think it's uh, no doubt going to be very interesting to see the results as you go on in this cross breeding program, isn't it? It certainly will, Dale. Thanks a lot, Dick, for taking the time and your helpers here uh, for giving us the opportunity to visit the beef research farm south of Ankeny and uh, see the first offspring from this cross breeding project. Now more so than before, young people is in a tremendous state of thinking for the first time in this country. And they see the problems that's uh, created, and they don't like the problems. But the different shift that we have now is in many social revolutions. You've always had the working class, who you can bring the army in and machine gun down. And then 50 years later, everybody say, oh, wasn't that horrible? And they become the heroes. But today we have the rich kid, white, the middle class kid, whose father's a virtue. Uh, he might not like his beard and his long hair, but he's not going to put up for the police knocking him down. The reason we have this attitude, I would say, that television, the mass communication system, for the first time, rich, well-off kids are able to see poor folks in their homes through television. And I would say had we had television 50 years ago, uh, that rich kid would have reacted the same way. I think it's very evidence of what happened in Chicago. Uh, the whole country was upset. Well, this has been going on in black communities and poor white communities for years. But all at once we got a kid that as society pretends they don't like this kid, he's still white and he's still not 
the animal that they want to make themselves believe he is. And so I would think now that the black movement is going to become very insignificant because black folks have been taught how to behave, even the most militant black folks. We get on television, talk about what towns we're going to burn down, and we don't mean it. We're just talking, getting rid of our frustrations. This white boy's not going to talk about no towns. He'll blow it up. The next thing you know, the town will be on fire. And I think that for the first time, we're going to have to go in, and we're going to have to deal with this problem. And if we don't deal with this problem, America will not be standing as she is today within the next 18 months. Are you partially saying that it's similar to the drug situation or anything else? As long as, it, as it's with uh, the uh, segment of the, income, of the uh, uh, population that has a low income and quite dependent, then nobody gets upset except just wipe it out because of uh, those people. But when it hits the upper middle class and the upper class, then uh, we have a completely different story. Yeah, but in America, you have a, 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 a different thing on the drug situation here. You see, the young kids came through and started using LSD, that they, they was making it themselves. And the drug industry in America, you buy a kilo of heroin in Turkey for $16 by the time it hits the American street, you have something like $10 million profit. This pays off a lot of politicians and a lot of police. And if you notice, since the young kids have started using LSD, there's been more heroin raids. There's been more heroin taken off of planes coming into America than ever before. There's been more of the hardcore syndicate that's getting busted for the first time because not knowing it, when the drug industry uh, moved from what the syndicate was supplying to what the young kids was making themselves, the crime syndicate in America lost a protection. Plus, in the black community, uh, within the last eight years since the civil rights movement have really come into its own, drug addiction have decreased about 30 to 42 percent in the black community. So the syndicate had all automatically lost the profits from that, plus from the white kids that usually move into the reefers and then later into the heron, they're not going this route anymore. And so I would say that this is why you can pick up a paper any day and read more horrifying stories about the effect of LSD that you've never been able to read in American paper about the horrifying effects of heroin. This is why the laws, all at once they start passing rigid laws across this country to deal with LSD and they never pass these laws to deal with heroin. Now going into a different vein, uh, with some of the emphasis on uh, education as far as uh, uh, black history, black literature, there is available now uh, bibliographies of black literature written, this is the literature written by uh, the black person. Do you think that uh, that there is any major difference in the analysis that might be by professionals, whether they be black and white, or do you have any particular books that you might suggest that would be well for a person to read? Well, uh, and then, you know, once we get into a level where uh, we get more sophisticated and know uh, what was going on, know who Crispus Attucks was, uh, know that Chicago was discovered by a black man, know that some of the, the most beautiful inventions we've had in this country was by black folks. But, you know, to say it now sounds like a trick. So, you know, people are going to have to expose themselves to it and then get the shock and then go do the research. You know, it's, it's unbelievable if you go to the patent office in Washington, D.C. and look up some of the patents of these inventions, it would, it would scare a lot of people to death because, you know, this whole society been orientated to the fact that black folks have been fools, that they've been ignorant, uh, that they never contribute anything to society. And so I would say, you know, that it's almost a must now. Uh, even the racists, it's a must that he learns black history because he needs it on his job now because it's going to come a day to get upgraded in any factory or form of American society, there's going to be certain things you must know about black folks, know his basic history. And this is why black folks is crying for it now, because of this tremendous change. And I would definitely say that uh, I would go to the library if I was white and concerned and uh, read every book I could get my hands on. Because, you know, black is the thing this year. I mean, that's not in America, but all over the world. And, I mean, they, the, the, the black colleges in America for the first time is being raided for industry. And they would pay more for a black man from a black school 
like Tennessee State than they would a black man from Harvard because, you know, they, they're not interested in a black man who thinks white. They're interested in a black man that thinks black, that knows what's going on in the black community. And when a man is going to hire a foreman, when he thinks, you see, you see, we're moving into an atmosphere now that in the plants uh, that have black and white people working, it's a possibility that a white guy could go and set the plant on fire and leave a sign and say black power. And, and so every means of American life now got to watch everything twice as hard as they used to. The insurance companies now, uh, it's easy for a white cat to burn his building down now and blame it on black folks. And so consequently, you know, areas are moving in now. The insurance companies are getting black insurance adjusters now uh, because, you know, somebody got to think black to go in and look and say, did black folks do this? Because there's certain things black folks do and certain things black folks don't do. And so I would say, you know, in all fairness, that with America being so unsophisticated to black history, uh, read anything you can get your hands on. And there's a lot of white folks that have books out on the black problem that's been out for years that I wouldn't overlook that neither. Can you name any particular ones that you feel should not be overlooked that are written by the whites, say? Well, I would say The Crisis in Black and White is a very important book. You know, I have thousands of them, so it's, it's, it's hard for me to really sit and say which ones. You know, Lerone Bennett, uh, who's not white, who's a black man, before the Mayflower. Malcolm X is a must, his biography. I have uh, three important books out. Nigger, which is my biography, The Shadow That Scares Me, and my latest one called Write Me In. Uh, probably the interesting thing about of these books is they'll usually mention names or refer you to other books uh, and I think that you know that if we're gonna deal with the problem it's gonna be like a doctor you know if he cares about the sick he got to go to med school if people want to know about what's going on you got to read these black books and for the first time they'll find out because we put on a game you see every black man in America should have Academy Award because we made a system think that we loved it when we hated it. We made a system think that we weren't afraid of it when we was. And there's a lot of white folks in America that don't know that uh, I'd rather be called nigger than boy. And so a lot of white people now feel if they don't use the word nigger, they safe and they'll use the word boy or they'll refer to the black woman as gal. And, and, and the only way that this society is going to understand uh, how black folks feel is reading black literature and finding out. See, we've been forced to read white folk literature, and this is why we're so violent. We know that George Washington marched on the British to get free.